like to welcome you to Robinson. Well, thanks, Mr. Reynolds. It's a pleasure being here, and uh, it's a nice being here in a nice little town. I hear it's the home of Heath Candy Bars. Yes, it is the home of Heath Candy Bars, and I wouldn't be surprised that maybe by the time you left town, you might even get a complimentary pack of those to take with you. Uh, Tiny, could you tell us, may I call you Tiny? Is that okay? Uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, tour of the Midwest with the Hoxie Brothers Circus. Uh, of course, we've uh, been used to seeing you a few years ago on the Laugh-In Show. Enjoyed you very much. And, of course, countless appearances uh, on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And all of a sudden, uh, Tiny Tim is on tour with the circus in the uh, Midwest. How did that come about? Well, it came about through a couple of agents of mine, uh, Banner Talent in New York and somebody else in Pennsylvania or Jersey. And first of all, I know some people say, uh, gee, he came down to the circus, he's coming down. Not really. In this business, you play everywhere. You're at the bottom, you're at the top, you're at the bottom. As long as you can keep living, uh, this, I consider this a part of vaudeville, except that in these modern days and age, you know, mortals not around anymore. But in the late 1800s, the early 1900s, uh, you know, the circus in vaudeville, there was always great eight big acts at the palace, including trapeze artists, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, it's a great thrill, and not only that, but I'm probably one of the only celebrity today in the world who's had a little name here and there to be with the circus afterwards. And so I have no complaints. It's a great way of studying what the circus life is about, seeing these great entertainers like, oh my gosh, the clown, Chico the clown, and you know, soccer ball and all the other acts, Mr. Lucky. It's a great, great thrill. I was going to say, too, your act really, from the first time we saw you in about 1968, really does harken back to the days of vaudeville. You can tell that at least a lot of the people that you admired uh, maybe during your uh, growing up years were, were rooted in vaudeville performing. So in that way, I guess it's not too surprising to see you uh, out uh, involved with the circus. Well, that's a very good point, Mr. Reynolds. But going back to the 1900s, uh, before Electric, before 1920, uh, in the years of Mr. Edison's phonograph, uh, mostly uh, top recording stars. I mean, Jolson and Cantor and all the rest of them, they were vaudeville stars. But I'm talking about record stars who were not vaudeville stars, like Billy Murray, Henry Burr, uh, Irving Kaufman, Byron G. Harlan, uh, who was Thomas Edison's favorite singer in 1905. These were also vaudeville stars. They went to circuses, uh, played in tents uh, around little areas here and there, and that's why you find so many records in the attics of small little towns because these great recording stars at the early times of recordings were also circus and vaudeville performers. Now what might we find in a Tiny Tim record collection then? A lot of uh, real uh, collector's items as far as 78 uh, RPMs are concerned and so on? Not only that, but cylinders. You know, everyone talks about 78s, but uh, Mr. Edison's cylinder from 1890 to about 1910 at that time was a great probably the great forerunner of everything that's phonographed today, thanks. I mean, uh, just to hear a voice on a cylinder roll was a miracle. Uh, and so today at the circus, tonight, they will hear, well, not these numbers, I'm all set, but they will hear numbers of the 20s with Mr. Moyer's orchestra, songs like Four Leaf Clover, It's a Long Way to Tipperary, originally sung by John McCormick in 1915 and Flory Ford in England in 1915. And they will also hear uh, songs like When the Saints Go Marching In. However, if I just may, since I have the ukulele here, okay. I'd just like to give you a little performance, a rare performance they won't see at the circus, or usually anywhere, not even in nightclubs, because, you know, this is not made for this type of a uh, situation. But it is a private rendition of Spirit of Byron G. Harlan, who was Thomas Edison's favorite singer in 1902. And when he sang this great song, the early cylinder recordings, the way I feel his spirit. Every ship will find a harbor, every bird a nest. Don't be sighing, don't be crying, all is for the best. I just want to say I love you, I'll do anything for you. Why, every ship will find a harbor, and our love will find one too. Let's hear it, gang, here in the old...
Now, uh, Tiny Tim, this, uh, this uh, you know, one thing leads to another. Now I have to ask you, because people have been asking me the past couple of days, they said, you're going to really interview Tiny Tim. Okay. Uh, does he talk like he sings? And first of all, I remember you, you know, your parents on TV, and I thought, well, no, the voice isn't, you know, you can go to a falsetto for, uh, you do sing tiptoe through the tulips during this circus performance, every show. Okay, so folks, you'll hear that tonight at uh, both performances. Uh, you have quite a quite a little range there, so there evidently are several Tiny Tim singing voices. Well, for instance, also one of the great stars in 1902 was a man who I guess, uh, I guess he turned over in his grave he heard this, but the fact is at that time was considered an early Tiny Tim, if one could even think of that. Well, that's a compliment. That'd be a compliment to the guy, wouldn't it? I hope so, but in those years, uh, he, he would stab me right now. But the thing is, I can say that Will Oakland, who was one of the first high voices in a period of time when they were just experimenting with records, was a rage of the age, sang this great song. Uh, in fact, he made the song famous throughout the world, almost in this way. You made me what I am today. I hope you're satisfied. You dragged and dragged me down until the soul within me died. You shattered each and every dream. You fooled me from the start. But now that we're through, may God bless you. That's the curse of a naked heart. Once again, Tiny Tim. Uh, does uh, a performer like yourself, I suppose the ultimate enjoyment is that feedback from the audience, the applause makes it all worthwhile? Oh, sure, and of course, having a great ringmaster like Mr. Billy Martin there, uh, you know, <laughs> with his glass and sort of eggs them on, uh, it really is a thrill. Also, I can say that the whole cast of the circus, the Hoxie Brothers Great American Circus, at the end they do do a number, which I join in with them, and there I will use the style. Nobody knows this really who's watching it until they hear it. I'm using the sounds of Billy Murray, one of the great Edison stars who was the most popular American record star from 1905 to 1920. Uh, more homes bought him, believe it or not, than John McCormick and Caruso. He was, and the reason for that, in the days before electric, I mean, his voice through a horn was very clear. Billy Murray, recording, and he sang this song. This, he was the one who made this famous on record. I, the same style, I do his same style. 1907, he sang this song. You're a grand old flag, you're a high-flying flag. Forever in peace may you wave. You're the emblem of the land we love, the home of the free and the brave. Every heart beats true for the red, white, and blue, where there's never a boast or brag. So should old acquaintance be forgot. Keep your eye on that grand old flag. Now, I was just using my, uh, cupping my hands to your listeners, Mr. Reynolds, uh, at the time when Billy Murray sang, every word was pronounced distinctly. And that's what made him so great. He came from Denver, and at the time he related to the mass America. Uh, he didn't have the heavy bass voice, a tenor voice that McCormick and Caruso had, but, and many singers of their day. Um, but he'd had a voice that was very popular, and it didn't need any microphones at the time, and he could relate to everyone singing at the bars as well as at home. And the words would come out very distinctly as if he was talking to you next door without the big opera airs. And he, was, he made that song famous. He made Harrigan famous. He made so many other great hits, uh, the Alcoholic Blues later on during the Prohibition, uh, in fact, he made, if I may do this, he made this song famous, which I also do in the show sometimes, in 1917. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Casey, beautiful Casey, you're the only g -g -g girl that I adore. When the m -m 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 moon shines over the cow shed, I'll be coming back to you forevermore. That deserves a round of applause here, gang. <laughs> now, Tiny Tim, you're great. I'll tell you, you're great. Now. What what uh, percentage of Tiny Tim is entertainer and what percentage of Tiny Tim is advocate of what we've been hearing right now? Because you obviously have a zest for this era. Uh, aren't you quite an advocate in addition to being uh, an entertainer? Uh, I'm sorry, what does the word advocate mean? Advocate, uh, strongly supporting this as, uh, gee, wouldn't it be nice if this music were popular today? I think we read an Associated Press story on Tiny Tim here about uh, maybe a month ago when the circus tour began, stating the fact that you were, and I'll give you a denial charge here if you want that, you were a bit disappointed at the fact that uh, after the uh, euphoria of Tiptoe Through the Tulips, you found it difficult to, to get a recording contract or that you wish you had one today that you could get this music out to the masses. First of all, that's absolutely positively 100% true. Uh, the thing is, uh, but you know, I came on the scene, I'm not knocking it, I praise the good Lord, thank God the Christ, that I hit it this way, I do it again because how many people can really hit the big time even once? yet alone so I, I i'm glad i got this new style i guess my only original style is the high voice uh but it's uh, you know you can't bring a whole mess of things in one shot in front of millions of people it takes time it takes years it takes days it may never happen only to a selected few like you here in the room uh you know so i thank the good lord for whatever talents he's given me so i'm satisfied whatever i got however and i repeat this again and i'm not trying to be dramatic I will say I would rather make a hundred bucks a month for life from a major label like Columbia or Victor than to give, let them give me a million dollars right from the start and sign me up for four years and if I don't sell records, it's goodbye. Because I can really, and I praise the Lord for his strength, it all comes from him, but I can really record for them in different, like in different spirits. Almost the whole repertoire of Byron G. Harlan, who recorded for Victor in Edison's Day. Henry Burr, who made more records for Columbia and Victor than any other artist. More than 50,000 shellac records from 1908 to 1929. Uh, songs from McCormick, from Cantor, from Irving Kaufman, up to the early Crosby, which I'll show you in a minute. I mean, I would love to put these records down, really, for posterity. And I won't demand this mo any monies really from these companies because I just want these songs to be heard and left with this great country. Uh, great songs which are forgotten, which are still prevalent for history today. Now, at the same time, I can't bring back these old songs. It was in a period of time that was there at the time. Teenagers make their own music, whether it's Van Halen today or Michael Jackson or whether it's Billy Murray in 1905, whether it's Ragtime in 1910, which teenagers made when they were growing up and parents at that time said bring back the old songs like in the shade of the old apple tree and that was in 1910 so so whether it's charleston in 1920 every t youth always makes their own music i'm not trying to bring back these songs uh it, it can never happen and if it did i wouldn't want it to because it was a period for itself but what i would like to do is only uh show the public the young public as well as the old the great songs that were there, and most important, to bring back the names. If any bringing back is just to bring to the forefront the names like Billy Murray, Irving Kaufman, Henry Burr, who were Edison stars, who all of them copied from, but are not giving their just right in the annals of the recorded industry. We only think of electric music from the 20s and on, from Rudy Valley to Crosby, whatever. But these great stars, Rudy Valley in a sense, subconsciously took from Henry Burr, who was a great star without a microphone in 1915. Uh, even Jolson in 1907 put an ad in Billboard looking for work. And at that time, Eddie Morton was one of the great early stars of the Edison era in vaudeville. So I want these names like Billy Murray and, and uh, you know Henry Burr brought to the forefront of the record industry and the public so they will know that these were the pioneers of the industry. If I just may show you a little comparison, now Rudy Valley, uh, in a microphone, was the first swooner crooner that the woman went crazy over in 1929. They roped off Times Square for him at the Paramount Theater in 1929 when he first appeared in vaudeville uh, uh, with his con seven Connecticut Yankees. 
The voice is not so great today. I just a little, here's the way he sounded in 1929. Now, when the microphone came in, most singers would sing a song, could not adjust to the microphone. These were the old Edison stars. When mics came in in 28, 27, they all sounded like this. Mm, Angela mia, you are my angel, dear. Well, that sound was heard repetitively until Rudy Valley came along in a weak voice, same song. Mm, mm, Hello, this is Rudy Valley, recording and singing a new song, Angela Mia. Over the microphone, when they heard a new sound like that, it was romantic paradise for the women. When he appeared in New York in 1928 at the Hi Ho Club, and they heard this voice over the air, the club was empty when he started on Monday, you couldn't get in by Friday. And it was a new type of sound over the microphone, a romantic sound. But Henry Burr, in a nasal tone, without a microphone in 1915, had a sound like this. Mm -hmm. I miss for the million things she gave me. Oh, means only that she's growing old. Tears for the tears she shared to save me. H is for the heart of purest gold. E is for the eyes of love light shining. R means right and right she'll always be. Put them all together. They spell mother, a word that means the world to me. Now, at that time, it was also nasal, but Mr. Bird did not need a microphone. Rudy Valley could have sang the same song, I'm as far as he, in a weaker sound. But in a sense, subconsciously, he took a bit from Henry Burr who was one of the greatest mother singers in that song he made famous in 1915. Hundreds of thousands of Victor records sold on that. And I would like to bring back the, I know the repertoire, about maybe 500 songs of Henry Burr's, uh, maybe 200, whatever, but albums over albums of these songs with the same arrangements so it could be left here in this country uh, to show how great these artists were. Uh, and then going on even to the days of Electric, when Bing Crosby came over the air, the early Bing Crosby, in 1931. Uh, you know, well, I probably think he had the greatest crooner's voice of all. Even Rudy Valley admitted he knocked him out of the box. Uh, he was the only one to give Amos and Andy competition. Five nights a week, at 7.15 to 7.30 over CBS, Cremo Cigar Hour. Here's a girl presents Bing Crosby. Just one more chance to prove it's you alone I care for. Each night I'd say a little prayer for. Just one more chance. I've learned the meaning of repentance. Now you're the jury at my trial. I know that I should serve my sentence. Still I'm hoping all the while you'll give me just one more word. I said that I was glad to start out, but now I'm back to cry my heart out for just one more chance. This is during you know, the, the Depression time. The same song over the NBC network in 1931 by Russ Columbo, who this is the 50th year when he passed away before his prime. The Romeo song, same song, sounded like this. Mm, just one more chance to prove it's you alone I care for. Each night I say a little prayer for just one more chance. 
the difference of contrast of the recording industry from the early days of, you know, Byron G. Harlan to the electric sounds to even something like this. Mm, I get up and nothing gets me down. Of course, of that, of course, this is, I only do those things when it comes to, to rock concerts, you know, not at the Hoxie Brothers Circus. You know. I was going to say, too, what, what's, uh, what's the newest song that, that you would do? Uh, do you include anything from the past uh, 20 years even, or would tiptoe through the tulips even when we heard that? Would that be one of the newer uh, songs, or is that an, an ancient tune, too? What's the Rousey? Tiptoe Through the Tulips is an ancient song. It goes back to 1929. Nick Lucas, one of the top ten singers of his day, did that uh, from the Gold Diggers of Broadway, which is one of the early Technicolor movie in sound uh, reproduction. Uh, I met Mr. Lucas at the age of 75 in 1968, and he was very happy now his song was brought back again. So it's not really a new song. In the, in the circus, the, uh, probably the newest song I do there is he's got the whole world in his hands. Uh, you know, because, uh, you know, only on for about 10 minutes, and it's just a community song fest. Uh, let me ask you this, uh, Tiny Tim. How did, how did it change you when, when you, uh, quote-unquote, hit big back in 1968 with the unexpected stardom that came from laugh-in appearance? And then, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I believe that the, uh, the wedding on The Tonight Show was the highest-rated program they had. I think that pulled an 85% share that night, according to Craig Tennis' book on Johnny Carson and The Tonight Show. So you were responsible for the highest-rated Tonight Show, and you had to deal with that fame for a couple of years. Did that uh, put you through a lot of changes, or were you still this good old Tiny Tim before and after? Well, I think you hit it right, just the same way before and after. Um... You know, uh, you did a lot of good homework, Mr. Alza. Uh, not many people read that Craig Tennis book. Uh, I have no, uh, no proof on this, but I think he could have said more than his book said. I think he must have been uh, told to just cool it. Uh, because you did get about you did get about a chapter in there though I don't know how accurate that was but there is a chapter called Tiptoe Through the Tulips and it's uh, it has to do with uh, Craig essentially being the person responsible for your appearance on that show is that true absolutely one hundred percent true uh, although my manager at the time Roy Silver who managed Bill Cosby also had a hand in it but uh, I think Mr. Tennis was the only one who could persuade anybody he was a top notch talent coordinator. Uh, at the time, and Rudy Tejas, who's no longer with them, but also started the Tonight Show. I mean, I'm sorry, the Tomorrow Show. Uh, after the Tonight Show, was the one responsible also for the wedding with Mr. Carson. Uh, there was friction there. Uh, I don't know if it was about me. I think it was probably with Mr. Carson's second wife, uh, something around that. I'm not sure what that was about. But uh, Craig Tennis was definitely with the Carson people till California, about 74, uh, when he went to California, about 72. But definitely, um, it's true that the that the uh, Mr. Tennis was responsible for everything there, and he took a lot of flack for even trying to get me on. Yeah, it, he mentions in the book that it was a, a huge gamble, but uh, like he says, and I think as everyone knows, it paid off. I mean, uh, the ratings were there for. I'm sure there were a lot of people who probably watched the Tonight Show on nights when Tiny Tim was going to be on that uh, probably wouldn't even have bothered because you were hitting a whole new audience there. Absolutely, but the Tonight Show, the ratings came later in 69. Uh, you're right, it was 85 some percent of every television set in this country plus satellite to Australia. Uh, also, um, it was still, it still is the highest rated show from a single individual performance not counting the weddings of England or the moonshot or any series like MASH. So from a single individual real-life performance, it still is the highest rated thing. It knocked Merv Griffin off the competitive edge. See, that's the real reason. That's why Mr. Carson did that. Nobody's touched that point, and he may deny it, but it's my opinion that he did that to knock the attention off Merv Griffin, who was on Channel 2 opposite him. And at that time, was getting a lot of press play. I think Craig mentions in his chapter, too, that that all of the sets at the Merv Griffin show, which was taped and syndicated, I believe, at that time, still is in some markets, but all the TV monitors were on the Tonight Show 
that night to see the the Tiny Tim wedding anyway. So, uh, but anyway, I just I just wondered if you were still uh, Tiny Tim uh, after that was all over, and if that affected you. And let me ask you this too: uh, How many other uh, entertainers are there out there that uh, you may be familiar with who who do what you do, which is essentially sing the the real old songs from uh, the nineteen hundred early nineteen hundreds and so on? Or is this a, you got the market sewed up on this? Well, I think at the mo- at the moment I may, but. You may have a million singers doing it. I mean, they've sang songs, let me call you sweetheart, for the last 50 years. This is not the point. I'm the only one who I'm trying to live, the, it's like 10 lives in 10 different years. I mean, from the years from 1919, uh, 1901 to 1920, uh, 1929, it's all Edison. And then it turns into Valley, then it turns into Crosby, then it turns into Swing, if I did the Sinatra years, or... Van Halen, if it was 1984, uh, they can all do the songs, but I'm living these spirits as if I'm there when I'm doing the songs at the time. It's not just singing it. It's actually being in that period of time and mentioning the singers like Billy Murray and Henry Burr, who never were mentioned. It's more than singing. It's actually, in a sense, like a time machine, you know, owing a debt, uh, a lost piece of a puzzle to an, an era that has all but been forgotten by their peers in the record industry. Does this, does this keep you young? Well, <laughs> we're on the air. <laughs> well, looking at young women keeps me young. <laughs> I, mean, I just got married again. Uh, I just got married again in June. Unfortunately, the annulment's coming in November. But uh, Will there be a song about this? I mean... Uh, you know, do you gain support from some of these songs? Some of the things were written so many years ago, their words can come back and comfort you through something like this, for example. Absolutely right. In fact, I, I, I want to say to all your listeners, Mr. Reynolds, I have pure thoughts. You know, I don't believe in having fooling around with women until marriage and then for kids. In fact, the only reason this marriage is breaking up is because she led me to believe before the marriage. She pointed to her belly and said, boy, we're going to have a house. And then when the marriage came, she had all medical problems. And so, def- and so definitely, uh, it wasn't even a tent. <laughs> I mean, you know, so the thing is, you know, uh, scripture-wise, you know, I-, I can't have SEX unless it's for kids. You know, can't, can't even say it then, really, apparently. You know, uh, you know, I can say sex if I want, but I, I, it's just a treasured word. And so, for the glory of God, you know, this must be, I can't make marriage a prostitution with a license. That's why I don't believe in birth control or rhythm or whatever. But the thing is this. Um, that there are songs to every woman I meet, uh, every classic that I hold dear, whether I marry them or not, uh, just for the memories, absolutely true. For instance, to Miss Jan, the one that, unfortunately, I I have to break up with and get the annulment in in November. There's a song that my... I have a movie, by the way, coming out in Australia another year or two called Street of Dreams, a Martin Shaw production. My my, My producer out there... And there was a song that was done in the old Australian or British music hall, which I dedicated to Miss Jan, which probably you never heard in this country, because I never heard it. This was taken off the BBC in Australia. Great song. Even the British Library hasn't got a copy of this. Done by uh, uh, Stanley Holloway before he passed away. This great song. Mm -hmm. If I should plant a tiny seed of love in the garden of your heart, would it grow to be a great big love someday, or would it die and fade away? Would you care for it? And tend it every day Till the time when all must part If I should plant a tiny seed of love In the garden of your heart Honey, if I should plant a tiny seed of love In the garden of your heart Would it grow? to be a great big love someday or would it die and fade away would you care for it and tend it every day till the time when all must part if I should plant a tiny seed of love in the garden of your heart 
Now, there's a rare song. That's dedicated to Miss Jan, right? Well, a lovely, lovely melody going back perhaps three, four hundred years. But any time I sing that song, I will always think of her. Miss Vicky had another one which was done in the 20s by uh, Franklin Bauer called Beloved. I always have songs for a certain uh, uh, people who are very, very close to me, uh, romantic-wise, going back to the 40s. Well, listen, uh, we have been visiting with Tiny Tim, and we want to remind everybody that uh, uh, Tiny will be uh, performing at the circus tonight, his own special brand of entertainment. I believe you, you uh, wrap up the show, don't you, Tiny Tim? Uh, as well as I do two shows, uh, in this, in, in, in the in, this is before the intermission. I'm on for about ten minutes, and then I wrap up the show with the cast, with the whole crew at the end. So there's two shows and two wrap-ups. How the heck can they get a Tiny Tim autograph? Can they stick around after the show? I'm always signing in the intermission. The clowns and myself are always there signing the clown books and at least 25 minutes of signing. Okay. And Tiny Tim will be headed to Vincennes tomorrow. So any of you folks down in that area, Lawrenceville, Vincennes vicinity, listening right now, the uh, Hoxie Brothers uh, Circus will be moving on down that way. Uh, we've got uh, some hearts, a smiley face, a snail, a star. Uh, it's colorful. Well, Mr. Hare brought me here. He didn't know these things. Well, I'll do this ukulele. Well, first of all, this is an old favela. It was comparable during Mr. Godfrey's time. Arthur Godfrey, well, I thought it was one of the great radio personalities and early television personalities. Uh, when he had his great television morning shows in the early 50s, he played the favela, and he recommended that. It was a, at that time, it sold for about $20, $25. Uh, it's comparable to a Martin selling at much higher prices. Mr. Favilla dropped the ukulele in the 60s. This is still an old model. must go back to at least 25 to 30 years. I picked it up very fortunately in State College, Pennsylvania about three years ago. Uh, the stickers were from a dear fan in Chica uh, Glen Ellen, Illinois. Miss Debbie Fireman gave me these things just recently. She came to see the circus with her lovely parents. Also, MTV, I had met a friend in Ohio uh, Mr. Fitzgibbons, who was connected with MTV, and he said, please wear the stickers. <laughs> you know, that's the, it is electrified. When I do my own shows in nightclubs, I will do, besides the old song, some rock numbers, and uh, definitely uh, I need this. I must be careful not to do too many rock numbers, because uh, I'm probably the only one past 50 to do Jump, right. or, uh, or Billy Jean, you know, feeling like 18. You know? now, now, what would a Tiny Tim uh, rendition of Billy Jean sound like? Let's, I just got to hear a little bit of this. She was more of a beauty queen from a movie scene. I said, I don't mind, what do you mean? I'm the one who will dance on the floor in the crowd. She told me her name was Billie Jean. She caused a scene. And every head turned with eyes, I dream of being the one who will dance on the floor in the crowd. People always told me, be careful what you do. And don't go around breaking your girl's heart. I see you just have a band together. And I want, I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, they were dancing in the living room during that whole darn thing. So. I don't want to take the time there, but also, I see, it's hard today to get... Now, if I did this on the stage for the first time, they think I'm changing. Not true. Whatever is top ten, whether it's 1880 or 1984, is what, what I do. But these songs I rarely do, except in my room. I always keep up with the top ten and transform the... the you know, like a chameleon from, let's say, Al Jolson to Michael Jackson. And I could not sing this song like I do Mammy, or vice versa. Uh, but, um, see, to the main audience today, because of my poor record uh, establishment with, with major labels, I can't get this across. So the only thing they know is the old songs and Tiflis of the Chulips, which is fine with me. But uh, whatever is top ten, uh, I'm the only one in the 50s, who well, I'm way up near 55, who has sung I Will Survive a couple of years ago, on a vaudeville review, and probably the and she dared to say, "What is that old man doing?" <laughs> <That's not laughs> what a pity to see an old man doing. I will survive, but I went over with the crowd. That's another reason Johnny Carson has not used me since 1979. I'd got on that show. I tell you, uh, I can't blame him because I had a real, uh, you know, strange outfit on, and I almost ripped off my shirt, and part of the belly button was showing, which I apologize for that. I had Tony Randall was the guest. 
David Letterman was a guest. He never used me on the show since. Now is Mr. Carson. And Mr. Uh, Cordova, Fred Cordova, gave me a look after this, but it knocked the crowd dead in that studio, and it took about five minutes before it calmed down. I did this number in this way. Mm, mm, if you want my body and you think I'm sexy, come on, baby, let me know. If you really need me, just reach out and touch me. Come on, sugar, let me know. Uh, I did this with a costume on. The band went crazy. I was rolling on the floor. When I got up, I mean, they, they all looked the other way, and Mr. Cordova came walking by with a strange glare. And I never heard from Mr. Carson since. <laughs> that was might have might have shot the old TV career there for a while. Then, now Tiny Tim, well, you, there should be communication on this. You should tell him that you'll cool it next time and give you know, give him another chance to get you back on there. Well, uh, he never said anything. This is just my opinion, but I could not do that because while it's important to be on, uh, these songs are important. I mean, you know, to get across to the audience. I mean, it was an interpretation the way I felt. Do you think I'm sexy should be done? And it wasn't vulgar at all. Uh, it was, uh, I love the melody. I've done it in my shows many times in the 70s. I used to be on the Roy Radin Vaudeville Review uh, and went over great with crowds. So, um, you know, there was no problem there. It's just that I think usually uh, I get too much carried away, you know, and I guess it was, yeah, a little... Uh, you know, but, uh, uh, you know, what can you do? I remember once in 1971, in January, January 1st, I was on Mr. Carson's show, and I was also banned for a while, uh, because Dick Sean was the host at the time, and I, I was in a very bad mood at the beginning with came Miss Vicky, I was married to her at the time. It was New Year's Day, 71 of Jan January 1st. I came up there, I did a song called Our Flag, which was a favorite song of President Wilson's. I can't remember how it goes now, but it was a 1917, it was his favorite song at the time, and also a song of the Kiwanis Boys Club. And it said something like, it's your flag, friend, it's my flag, it belongs to you and me. And somebody gave me a heckle, you know, from the crowd, and I really got angry. I said, look, if you don't like me, it's one thing, you either like your country or get out of here. And of course, I got a lot of applause, I got 200 telegrams in favor, but it didn't go well with the night show. And I wasn't on there also for a while. <laughs> you know, I, I think it'd be great to see you on uh, the David Letterman show on Late Night. Well, you seem to, yeah, but you, he's kind of got kind of a young audience, and you're an interesting performer. I'll, I'll put it this way. Dave has the type of guest that is uh, off the beaten path, let's say. You won't find uh, Michael Jackson or some of those fellows on there, but Tiny Tim would strike me as being a perfect guest for uh, Dave's show. Yeah, but he won't use me. Uh, Many reasons are, uh, a lot of times, are uh, these people, I don't mean, I don't know what his viewpoints are, but usually when you have very, very tight, you know, liberalistic views, you know, uh, see, uh, I'm not, they can laugh if they want, but I'm, I'm not a comedian. Uh, if he gets into a subject that seems to be, you know, serious and he makes light of it, I, I may have a commitment to say, wait a minute, uh, he may not want that. Dave would do that, too, I think, oh. you know, because he has a habit of ridiculing his guests, so in, in retrospect, that might not be a good idea. Oh, well, maybe he wouldn't want that either, maybe. <laughs> you know, well, we want you, and we want to invite everybody out again this evening. The Hoxie Brothers Circus is in town. Two performances tonight. They'll be headed to Vincennes tomorrow, and uh, Tiny Tim will be available to sign those autographs if you want to come on by and, and uh, do that. And we'd like to thank you very much, Tiny Tim, for visiting with us today. Well, Mr. Rounds, I want to thank not only you for being a wonderful interviewer. You know, most people, you know, are concerned in their own selves and just you're trying to crack jokes, but you were really a good interviewer, and it shows and every one of your family here, and it's here, and Mr. Hare for taking me down. Basically, so, you know, you got the most because uh, uh, definitely I could not really do this on many stations if they were interested only in their own promotion. So I think as a credit to you, really, without making you feel this, in fact, I've been around, believe me, and I think uh, many other stars who are coming through this area should have more interviews with you. Too bad you couldn't get the, we couldn't get the rest of the troupe up here from the circus. A couple of clowns, you know, and, the, and uh, you know, the, uh, there's a fellow there called uh, Mr. Helga. He has a boxed kangaroo and uncaged lions, you know, that come on the show. You know, this is a safe show, though, isn't it? <laughs> so far, I mean, I, I'm just afraid he invited me to his trailer the other day. <laughs> 
and the lions were right next door. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't even murmur anything when I walked in. They might have been ready, to, you know. But the thing is, though, it's a very safe circus, and it's a wonderful place to work for. Tiny Tim, how about closing out our interview with a few strains of Tiptoe Through the Tulips? We'd like to hear that. No, Tiptoe by the window, by the window, that is where I will be. Come Tiptoe through the tulips, away from me. Oh, Tiptoe oh, by the shadow, by the shadow, of the willow tree. Come Tiptoe through the tulips, away from me. In flowers we'll strip, we'll keep the shadow away. And if I kiss you in the garden, in the moonlight, will you pardon me and tiptoe through the tulips with me? Very good. We've been having a special visit with Tiny Tim here on WTAY on this Monday afternoon. Invite everybody to the Hoxie Brothers Circus tonight. And Tiny Tim, thank you once again. Oh, Mr. Reynolds, it's a pleasure, and thank you for all being so nice. And Jerry, we'll send it back to you to the studios.